a very common form of regularization is to use some penalty on the parameters that are being learned. So parameter norm penalties. And the idea is we have a loss function, an unmodified loss function, which somehow describes the, for example, a reconstruction error, or a classification error, um, um, a negative log likelihood, whatever loss we want to compute and minimize. And then we add a term which depends on the values of the learned parameters themselves. Usually some multi multiplier, uh, some hyperparameter alpha multiplied with a norm of the parameters. And the idea here is that we want to avoid excessively large parameters. Now often we have some approximate invariances. So there are some parameters that are not really important and we can increase some parameters. If we also decrease other parameters, so we can have some parameters plus a very large number, other parameters minus a very large number and they just compensate for each other. Um, and whereas this might be fine in the training set, this can create a lot of variance. So it can be quite bad for the generalization. So we avoid this. And um, also important is here that if we have weights and biases, such as in neural networks, we usually only apply such penalty terms on the weights, not on the biases. Because the biases are really crucial uh, for estimator bias. Uh, so that two times bias in here. So what I mean is we do not restrict the value of the trainable biases, bi, because if we would do that, maybe we would have a huge bias of the estimator. And the reason is we have to be able to shift means, for example, if our data is not, not mean-free. So we need to use these parameters in order to represent the function that we're trying to learn well. But we may want to restrict the value range of these weights here, of these weight matrices. Okay, so what is used a lot here? Well, the probably most common form of parameter norm penalty is the L2 norm, so L2 regularization, also called Rich regularization or Tikhonov regularization. That's all the same, just different terms for the same thing. Um, so in linear methods like, like regression, for example, we usually speak of Rich regression or regression with Tikhonov regularization. In neural networks, we usually call the same thing weight decay. And then there's L1 regularization that is quite common where we penalize the sum of the norms of the weights. And uh, these are basically sparsity constraints. So they promote small values of in many parameters. They do not really enforce zeros if we want zeros, zero parameters, because we're interested in the structural sparsity, then we additionally have to cut off small values. So it generally it generates approximately zero weights or approximates zero weights. Another very important class of regularization methods is parameter tying and sharing. So basically we are limiting the capacity or expressiveness of a, of a function or a model by restricting the parameter range that can be assumed. And in, this, in the slides before we did that by adding some norm penalty on the size of the parameters, but here this is about making certain parameters similar or the same. So one thing we could do is if we train multiple copies of a model uh, to try to make their parameters be similar. So to try to agree the, uh, to try to make them agree on pr in parameter space. A more formal form um, of this sort of regularization is parameter sharing. And that we have seen before. So we have seen convolutional neural networks, for example. So here we use really the same parameters to um, apply a filter operation on a certain pixel independent where this pixel is. So uh, we apply the same parameters across the image and this results in a certain symmetry or in this case 
translational equivariance. So this is relation related to translation symmetry, to the translation symmetry group. And this is a good example of where the regularization method, so in this case parameter sharing, reduces the set of functions we can represent. Yeah, a convolutional layer is a strict special case of a dense layer. So we can write a convolutional layer uh, in the same form as a dense neural network operation. It's just a, a linear layer with a, a weight matrix that has a special form. Um, but it's a great idea to do that if you know that you have translational invariance, that you want to be insensitive of where an object is in the image. So you're not actually giving something up by reducing the expressiveness or the class of functions you can use to learn. You're actually winning something because you're just re restricting yourself to functions that make sense. So you're disallowing functions that don't make sense and you gain something in terms of statistics. You reduce your variance. You, you, you reduce the risk of making bad predictions that you haven't trained on. An important form of parameter sharing is multitask learning. So suppose we have a prediction problem with different outputs or different tasks. So we have one input, for example, images of cars, and we want to predict different types of output. So let's say, what's the producer, what's the model, and uh, what's the age of the model. And um, these are, of course, not independent predictions. So the ages, the age ranges will depend on the model, as certain models have been made in certain ages in, at certain times. But um, you may have um, different ranges of ages for different models. So it's reasonable to believe that much of the processing that has to be done in order to, um, to make these different decisions can be shared in the parameter space. So you may, for example, have convolutional neural layers, pooling layers, etc., and end up at some latent space representation here, and then just use shallow, um, densely connected neural networks that go uh, to the, the maker or the model prediction and to the age prediction. So if you have cases like this, it is more efficient to share part of the parameters than to train independent neural networks on the different tasks separately. It's statistically more efficient to combine part of the parameters because you have to largely solve a similar problem for both tasks or for the multiple tasks. An example of this um, is the AlphaGo Zero model. That's a machine learning model that was developed by DeepMind to learn playing the game Go. It's a reinforcement learning model, um, so it uses uh, one algorithm to explore the state space. So to start with the current state of the game that we are at and to explore different options of making moves and to try to ac assess which sequence of moves will bring me closer to winning the game with, a, with the highest probability. And this is a Monte Carlo algorithm, which, which does this part. But this Monte Carlo algorithm uses two neural networks in order to help him help it make these decisions. And this is a value and a policy neural network. And these neural networks take the current and the past few game states as an input, then put it through a deep neural network. That's a residual neural network. We will see later what exactly this is. But for now, it's just a deep neural network. And this deep neural network has two heads, just um, two shallow output heads that are different, the value head and the policy head. And so the value head basically assesses what is the, the, the value of the current game state. So how good is the current state of the game for me? What's the probability of me winning from this state on? That's important in order to understand 
um, which states as I go deeper in the, into this decision tree of making moves in the future, how, how good are these states for me? And then the policy head basically tells me which parts of the tree to expand. So um, this tells me which future moves should I take with what probability. So it helps me to reduce the branching size of the tree and to um, cut down the many options to a few options that I will consider in the future. And as you see, the network is very deep, so it has many parameters, but most of these parameters are shared between these two networks, value and policy network. And um, this architectural decision to merge most of these two networks into one shared parameter space um, actually explains part of the better performance of AlphaGo Zero with respect to AlphaGo.